Hello and welcome to my channel In Search of Wonder. My name is Anne and today we are celebrating 500 subscribers. So this is now my fourth take here. So whatever happens, it's gonna happen. And this video is going to be posted. I'm probably not gonna do much editing because I'm running out of time for that. So we're going to do the Q&A questions that you all submitted for this episode. And at the end, I will do a little giveaway. I'll open up a giveaway and we are going to celebrate 500 subscribers. So before I get into the questions, I just wanna say a big, huge, Thank you so much to each and every one of you 500 who hit the subscribe button and to all of you who comment on um, my videos and join in the conversation with me. Um, when I first started my booktube channel, I didn't really have any goals or dreams in mind for what I wanted to accomplish here other than that I wanted to talk about books with people who like to talk about books. And mission accomplished. Um, as far as I'm concerned, I love this community that has developed here and grown around my channel and I have no definite absolute number of goals of wanting to um, have like, you know, 5,000 subscribers or so, whatever. I'm just happy for each and every person who is here, who is talking books with me, listening to me and responding in the comments. So I love this. Um, this little group that we have gathered here and I am so thankful for it. And now onto the questions. So first of all, I have several questions from Penny, who is a very faithful viewer and commenter. So I love chatting with you, Penny, here and on the other channels that you like to frequent um, and on Instagram. So first of all, the question is, do you still do keto and intermittent fasting? And the answer is yes-ish, not keto necessarily. I started doing keto back a little over a year ago, um, about 14 months ago, in a desperate last ditch effort to finally lose weight that had been just hanging on for over a decade. And nothing was working to get rid of it. So I started a program that was largely based on keto principles. Um, although once you got to maintenance, then the idea was to um, relax into more low carb. Um, but then my, in the middle of all that, I was running numbers on my thyroid and stuff. And my doctor felt like, um, I needed some more carbs. Like my body wasn't getting enough carbs. So I went from keto to more low carb a little bit sooner than I had intended to. Thankfully, I still kept losing weight and I lost almost all the weight that I wanted. Now I'm kind of in maintenance mode, but I still have like five to seven pounds that I want to lose. Um, so I really need to be a little bit more strict than I am right now, um, but I, I found that difficult um, with with the sports season and the busy schedule that we have and special events that keep happening, like birthdays, like there's a bazillion birthdays in my family from um, February through May, and it's just really hard to be consistent, um, but I'm doing my very best. Um, I eat low carb as much as is possible. Uh, for example, yesterday we were at my niece's graduation and there was a reception afterwards and they had like, you know, meats and cheeses and shrimp and that kind of stuff. So I ate all of that, my fill, and then I just had, I took a little slice of cake, but I only had like two bites because I just wanted to taste <laughs> the frosting that looked like a whipped cream frosting on the filling. And so I had two little bites and it was perfect. So um, that's kind of where I'm at with that. Um, I definitely eat very, very little sugar, only on special occasions, like the couple bites that I had at the reception or for a birthday party or something, like just a little taste now and then. Um, I do eat some like potatoes or um, some kinds, some breads and some pastas in small amounts, periodically, depending on what's going on in life, etc. Mostly I do low carb fish and um, I have some more weight I need to lose, so I need to be a little more serious about tracking it, etc. Intermittent fasting I have done um, for many years now, and like low carb, I see it as a permanent lifestyle. For me, um, I find that when I eat too many carbs, um, then I immediately start gaining weight. So I have to eat the, I have to keep the carbs to a minimum and um, intermittent fasting is a good way to help with that. 
and um, I've, I've just, intermittent fasting has kind of become a way of life for me. I typically fast 16 to 18 hours a day and except for, you know, when I'm on vacation or a special occasion or something. So, or when our schedule's really wonky, um, but it's pretty much just routine for me at this point. And next question is a fun question also from Penny. What is your favorite cut of steak? And a couple of years ago, my brother-in-law introduced me to a Brazilian cut of steak called picanha, which is amazing. And I have requested it for my birthday the past couple of years. Um, my husband smokes it in the smoker and it's just amazing. It's so tender and so flavorful. It has like a thick layer of, of fat on the top that you, um, you can uh, take off some of it before you cook it, um, but it just brings so much flavor to the meat. It's delicious. And then her next question, were Austin's books the impetus for loving classics? And actually I have to say, probably not because I didn't read Austin until I was um, a teenager at some point, my late teenage years. And by that point, I already really loved classics. Um, I think probably the bigger impetus was that my mom um, had kind of Charlotte Mason ideals when it came to what we read um, before Charlotte Mason was really popular. and she didn't use these terms, but she didn't really want us reading too much twaddle as she called, as, as it's called now by Charlotte Mason and Charlotte Mason uh, proponents. Um, she wanted us to read literature and books that were edifying and um, timeless, that, that were nurturing to our minds and not just brain candy as she called it. She, called, she said brain candy instead of twaddle. So. Um, so I read many, I read many, many children's classics as a child. And then going into my teen years, then I just began to read um, regular classic literature. And that just continued into my adult life because I really gained a love for some of those authors and discovered new ones. I'm always discovering new ones as I go along. Um, so that was really, honestly, probably more my mom and the reading environment that she created when we were growing up. And then um, the next question from Penny, last question from Penny, I should say, which is your favorite Austin? And that kind of depends on the day, but most days I would say Pride and Prejudice, but there are some days when I would say Emma. It's kind of a toss up between the two sometimes. All right, and then next question from Cheryl at Candlewick Library. Uh, her question was, who is your favorite composer? And that is a difficult question to answer because I definitely do not have just one favorite composer. It kind of depends on the day, the mood, the purpose, the occasion. Um, but I'll start with Beethoven because Beethoven has been a consistent favorite since I was young. Um, I just love the the emotion in his, his music. And the more I have listened to Beethoven and played some Beethoven, and um, learned about his music, the more I love how he, he he tells a story musically and he's really good at creating suspense. Like his, his music always has strong emotion in it and there's always some drama going on, but he has a really just this great ability to create suspense in a song, which m may not be readily obvious just listening to it casually, but if you're paying attention to it, um, there are definitely these moments in his music where it's like, oh, and then, you know, there's a culmination of something. So love Beethoven. I also really, really, really love Rachmaninoff. And I wish I had larger hands that I could play Rachmaninoff more successfully um, because his hands were like, he was really known for his, his um, range that he could play of notes. And his music is full of like a big chords, his piano music. Um, so I love his um, his piano music, absolutely gorgeous. Some of my favorite piano music, his um, piano concertos are my favorite piano concertos. So Rachmaninoff is another one, but I also really admire Bach and his, um, his uh, Bach and Mozart both were very intellectual composers and their music is very intellectual. And it is also very beautiful to listen to. Bach's has surprising amount of emotion in it also. Um, even though he was writing within strict confines of um, Baroque forms, he, it was very emotional. Um, same with Handel. I really love, I, there's not anything by Handel that I have hated having listened to it. I really love um, everything Handel wrote, but 
not much of his music like rises to the level of, oh, I love it, favorite status, except for his Messiah. But so much of his music is just beautiful to listen to anytime. And um, Mozart would mostly say the same as well. I also love Rossini's operas and I love Verdi, his operas and his Requiem, especially one of my favorites, favorite art pieces of music. And then Jay from Faceless Book Reviews asked how I met my husband, which is a great, great question and a great story, which I will try to condense so that this video is not too overly long. Um, but let's see, go back 20 years and I was single and I had a really good friend and she and I were both teachers and we both taught in private schools, but different ones. And we attended the same church and we were really good friends. And she was of a very romantic turn of mind. I have actually always been pretty practical, practically minded, down to earth sort of thing, but she was very romantical and she was always trying to set people up. So one day she just determined that she was going to set me up with her cousin. And so she arranged for um, our singles group at our church to go on a trip to Baltimore. And her, we were in Northern Virginia and her cousin lived in Columbia, Maryland, which is not far from Baltimore. So she invited him to meet us there. We were supposed to go to a ball game, um, the Baltimore Orioles. And all of that changed, but whatever, that's not important to the story. So um, if you ask me and my husband about that first um, meeting, uh, we would refer to it differently. He considers that our first date it was not our first date. That was like a, a group outing wherein we had an opportunity to meet and kind of like observe at arm's length, if you will. Low pressure, etc. I would not have agreed to any other situation. So, um, we went on this outing and the plans had to change that's not important, but we were hanging out in Baltimore, large group of us. One little funny story about that. Uh, so I have a lot of siblings and um, I don't know that Jonathan, my friend's cousin, now my husband, was aware of that when Jessica told him about me uh, because we were in Baltimore. I think that we were um, outside the Museum of Science in Baltimore and um, like some people were like going to the bathroom or doing whatever. So we were like kind of like in and out. So I was not there at the time. Oh, my goodness. Sorry, I had to get my husband's birthday cake out of the oven. Anyway, so we, some of us were sitting out on steps outside the Baltimore Museum and Science Museum. And my, and Jonathan, he said to a young gentleman who was part of the group, he said, man, there are a lot of flugies. Flugie being my maiden name. And so <laughs> this young man said in response, yeah, and they're all annoying. Said young man being my brother, spoken as only a brother can do about his sisters. And so <laughs> my, <laughs> my husband, Jonathan, was a little taken aback by that. But anyway, funny little story about our meeting. So, um, at the end of that outing, my friend, Jessica, she had stayed at her cousin's house, their family's house. Um, and so, but she had driven or ridden into Baltimore with her cousin, Jonathan. And so they had to go back to, to his house to get her car to drive back to Virginia. But she didn't want to drive back to Virginia in the dark by herself. So she asked me, to come with her, right? This was all part of her little scheme here. So um, we were in his car in the parking garage and then there was an accident at the opening of the only exit slash entrance to the parking garage. There was an accident right there. And so everyone was stuck in the parking garage for like two hours until the accident could be cleared up. And so if it had not been for that, it's quite possible that our meeting would never have gotten any further because we hadn't really talked a lot to each other um, or maybe we would have had to meet a few more times. Um, but as it was, we were stuck in a car for two hours. My friend Jessica and another friend who had come with 
they got out of the car and they were like, I don't even know what they were doing. They were walking around, they were talking to other, I don't know. Anyways, they were walking around and goofing off. And so Jonathan and I had plenty of time to just talk. We were just sitting there, there was nothing to do but talk. So we talked a lot and got to know each other pretty well in two hours of solid talking. So by the time um, we, we actually left and got home, um, I was thinking, okay, I can see, you know, there's potential here. He seems like a nice guy. You know, we have, we're, we're compatible in a lot of different areas. So, um, but I do not talk on the phone. I don't do it. And I knew that he literally like a short time before this outing, he had decided to go back to school to get a second degree that would be in graphic design. And so he um, was planning to go away to South Carolina to school for the rest of that school year. This was in August when we met. So he was like literally going to leave the next week. So there was no chance for us to meet again in person or to join in, you know, have more group outings or whatever. So I thought to myself, well, if he asks for my phone number, that's a big no. Like I'm just not doing it. I don't talk to people I know on the phone, let alone people that I don't know very well. So if he asks for my email address, I'll take that as a sign. Back then we did not text because it would cost money to text. So we didn't text. Um, but I was like, email, I can do email. So lo and behold, he asked for my email address and the rest, as they say, is history. 20 years later, two kids in a house, you know, that's life. So that is how I met my husband. And we always say that God orchestrated it so that we had those two hours to talk in the parking garage or otherwise it probably would not have gone anywhere. It was that two hours that kind of like gave us the opportunity to really know each other. And the second thing that really made a difference for me was because I was, this may be difficult to believe, but I'm, I'm very introverted. And at that age, I was as, uh, I was kind of growing out of it a little bit, but as a teenager and a young adult, I was very, very shy, very shy, very self-conscious. And the, um, the whole process of like going on in-person dates, one-to-one -one with someone you don't know very well was incredibly daunting to me. And so the fact that he was going away, um, meant that we communicated, um, long distance for, the majority of that school year and we only went on like a date at Christmas time and then we talked on the phone for the spring semester um but by that time we got to know each other really well so it, I was comfortable talking on the phone to him and then we when he came back in person um like it wasn't it wasn't awkward or weird to um you know to be going on dates and stuff and the whole one-on-one -on -one in-person relationship but what I really loved about being online first is that it gave us an opportunity to talk to each other without any pretense, without trying to come across one way or the other. Like we could just be real. Um, and I think that also was another thing. I, I could be real and genuine with someone writing. I could write a lot better than just speaking in person. So that was the other thing that helped us, helped move our relationship along. So God knew, um, God knew what he needed to do with me to get me <laughs> together with Jonathan to help me out a little bit in my hangups and insecurities that I had back at that time. So that is the answer to that question. So thank you, Jake, for that question. And next, a commenter who shall remain nameless, but whose username is Buckeyes08, because he was born in 2008 and he's a big fan of the Ohio Buckeyes for some reason that nobody knows. He asked me, do you have a favorite son and who is it? Yes. That was his question. You can all guess who asked me that question and I am not going to answer it. Moving on. Morgan at Morgan's Endless Bookshelf. Morgan said, if you could have lunch with one classic author, who would it be? And I think we all know the answer to that one. If y'all wanna do as I do in my music classes, I snap my fingers and have them give me a group, what I call a lightning answer, like say their answer one time. Can y'all answer this question when I snap my fingers? Which author would I have lunch with? If you said Austin, you are right. Yes, I would love to sit with Jane Austen and have lunch with her. I feel like she's, she's um, witty and funny and very personable. 
and I think that she would put me at my ease. But I also think, um, Morgan's, the second part of her question was, what would you talk about? And I feel like Jane Austen and I would just probably have fun over lunch, um, just being really critical and judgy because I feel like if you ever read her letters, uh, she definitely has that, that capability in her. And I feel like um, as horrible as it sounds, it would be highly amusing um, to sit and talk about, um, I don't even know, like other authors, other books, other people, like maybe actual historic people, people that we see, people, other people in the restaurant, people watching, whatever. Probably would be fun. Uh, but I think also, I think that um, our world views would be very similarly compatible and that we would have a lot to discuss. So I would truly enjoy having lunch with Jane Austen. And then Morgan also asked, what about one classic character that I would have lunch with? And that is a lot harder. And I don't know that I have a good answer for that. I don't know. I've been sitting here and thinking about this for a minute and I just... I don't want to say a Jane Austen character because I feel like that's so like overused for me, like it'll be my answer to everything. But I think so many other characters, like I was thinking about Little Women, like in my mind, so many of the characters in books, they're like celebrities to me in a way. And it's like, I would feel a little bit tongue tied if I actually got to talk to them. Um, so that's a really hard question. Um, I would, I would just be like frozen and not able to talk to them. And some of them, I feel like, <clears throat> like Jane Eyre, for example, I feel like she's not the sort of person who like puts you at your ease. Like you have to put her at her ease in order to be able to engage with a stranger. So I'm not good at that. So I would need someone who would put me at my ease. So I feel like, um, for example, um, Lizzie would be good at that. Um, but I, that feels like a cop out because I feel like Austin is my answer for everything. Um, so I think another one that could be a potential would be Anne of Green Gables because I feel like she would really put me at my ease as, you know, as an adult, like when she was, you know, it was about my age and, you know, she had some um, teenage children or whatever. I think that that would be really fun to have lunch with her. And I think that I would not need to talk. I would not need to put in a word edgewise because she would do all of the talking and I, she would make me feel really comfortable and I would just have to sit and listen to her talk. And that would be amazing. I'd love that. So that's my answer. Anne of Green Gables. Um, or maybe more like Anne of Ingleside or Anne of Rainbow Valley. Anne of Rainbow Valley. That Anne. I would talk to her. All right. And then Lucy at the Lucy Chronicles ask me what is your life verse or share some of your favorites and this is a great question and i don't really have a life verse per se um there are verses that continually come to my mind um that that have stuck with me throughout my life and have really guided me um through my life uh so i'll share a couple of those verses one of the verses is luke 12:15 and I believe the Gettys even wrote a hymn about this, which is a really good one. And Jesus is speaking and it says, and he said to them, take care and be on your guard against all covetousness for one's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. And to me, that's such a good reminder. Um, I think it's so much true in throughout the Western world, but in particularly the area that I live in is extremely affluent and it's very, very easy. All, all, all of my friends who are believers who live in this area, we, we agreed, we all struggle with the rampant materialism in this area and not allowing it to rule our hearts. So for one's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions is a constant reminder to me um, not to focus my eyes on things and abundance of possessions because that is not where true life lies. And then Psalm 112 verse seven um, says, he is not afraid of bad news. His heart is firm, trusting in the Lord. And I actually have that verse in my bathroom where I can see it every day um, because I really love that. Um, just having that steady trust in the Lord and not being anxious about what might come or what might happen or, you know, it, because there are times when, when bad things are happening all the time and you're, you're just um, like wondering, okay, what's next? But then there are even times when, when life is going great and life is good and everything seems to be rolling along smoothly and you're just, 
I, well, I don't know about you, but I would have this thought at the back of my mind, like, okay, when's the other shoe gonna drop? You know, life can't be this good all the time, right? Which is so ridiculous. Um, so I love that verse to remind me just to confidently trust in the Lord and be firm in my trust in him and let him handle the future and what's going to come. And then finally, another one is um, from James chapter one, verse 20. And it says, for the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. And that is just a great reminder to me. Um, I honestly, I, I didn't really struggle with anger too much until I had kids. And then it was like, um, you know, when you have these, these people who don't just do what you want them to do all the time. And yet there are things that they have to do that you need, you know, like in order for them to be successful, thriving human beings, it's very important that they do what you tell them to do, but they don't want to because they're humans with their own mind and their own will. And there's this constant, you know, um, I don't know, conflict is the wrong word because it's not like our, our family life is full of conflict in that sense. But there, there is that, that tension, I guess, of, you know, trying to raise these human beings to be productive humans. And um, at the same time, they don't really want to be raised. They just want to live in their fleshly human desires and do what they want to do. Anyway, that can generate some serious anger in my own heart. And a friend said this um, verse to me at one point, um, not uh, not for me, she was saying it, you know, as, as a verse that had been very benef beneficial to her in her parenting life. And I was like, oh, that is so good. I need to remember that. So ever since then, that has been very much a guiding verse in my life um, to remember that my anger is not going to help my children and raise them. It's going to harm them, actually. So um, I need to redirect myself away from anger before I can ever hope to redirect them and help them and help them to grow because my wrath is not going to produce righteousness in them. It's just not going to happen. So that has been, those have been some kind of guiding verses in my adult life. And then Tammy at the protagonist pop had some great questions. Um, musical lyrical book recommendations for parents and children's <laughs> for parents of children of all ages that have that musical spark. And that is a great question. And I don't have like a single like one book or book recommendations to mention. I will say I made a video of picture books that I use at work and um, for music classes. And I recommend any of those books in there. They're, they are applicable and usable, not just in a music class context, but just in reading and general life with your children. Um, and so I highly recommend any of those. Um, but I will say, I will recommend some like types of books that are featured in that video uh, that you can apply. Like there, there are multiple, multiple, multiple um, dozens of examples of each of these books that you can find one to your preference um, and read it to your children at any stage. So when they are very young, um, number one, please, for the love of God, please do not buy those books that have the little sound samples that play a little tinny sound. Don't do it. That is not music, my friend. Don't do it. It's much better to pull up a song that's played by actual instruments on YouTube or Spotify or something. And if you must, accompany a book about said song. So first of all, that's the type of book not to get. I have strong feelings about that in case you can't tell. Anyways, um, but any book that explores the vocal range and encourages students to, or encourages children, young children, I'm talking about young children here um, from the time they're born, that encourages them to vocalize and to make sounds or when they're babies and they're not capable of mimicking you, you can still read it to them and put in their ear their whole the whole range of sounds. Um, so anything that explores sounds like, um, well, this is a video, but <laughs> what does the fox say is a good one, actually. Um, but also, um, uh, oh, there's a Dr. Seuss one. There are a couple of Dr. Seuss ones. Any Dr. Seuss is good for this, but there are a couple of Dr. Seuss books like um, Fox and Socks, I think, is one. And um, um, Mr. Moo. No. 
Mr. Brown can moo. How about you? Something like that. I forget. I read it every year to my kindergarten students. Now I can't think of the name of it, but any book that en encourages vocalization and just has nonsense words in it or really fun rhyming words, um, any kind of book or story that has like a rhythm to it that, um, or like a poem that moves like this. Again, Dr. Seuss is great. Dr. Seuss really needs to be read with, um, with a meter and a beat. Um, for the best experience. But another one that I can think of is Chicka Chicka Moo Boom. That's really fun. Um, it's very musical. Um, so these, this is, may not be like what you'd initially think, oh, that's great for um, developing musical ability or interest in music, but it really does actually. Anything that helps them feel a beat and um, vocalize um, will really be building important skills. Like that's, those are the first things I do in kindergarten is begin to develop a feel for the steady beat and to be able to vocalize in a wide range. Any book with a lot of animal sounds in it. So you can go up high and down low, like mooing low for a cow or meowing high for a cat is really good. Um, also, uh, there are another type of book that is great, especially, you know, when they're babies up through preschool and even into elementary school is, um, singing books, but not the kind with the button that you press that makes the music, but you have to sing the song or you can play a recording of the song if you must. Um, but books like, um, uh, there are quite a few versions of over in the meadow. You're like, over in the meadow, da, 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 da. and they're different. They're all different versions, they have different pictures, different illustrators, but a lot of them also have different text or they make they make up different settings besides the meadow or whatever, but it all goes with that song. Um, there are singing books for like hymns, singing picture books of hymns, of, of pop songs, popular songs that, um, you know, like Beatles songs or whatever that have made their way into um, the common musical culture of, of, of our country and our language. Um, so I would read and sing those, any genre, any genre that interests you. I'm particularly fond of folk songs um, and reading, singing those folk songs so that they stay alive from generation to generation because it's very important. It's a musical language. So any of those. Um, and there are, there, are, there are hundreds of those types of books. Um, and some of them are in the video that I mentioned, some of my favorites, um, like The Fox Went Out on a Chilly Night is a fun one. And, oh, but there are tons of them, so many. And you can find one, um, a one that I used to have, um, it's a song by um, Rafi, I think. Um, oh, it's the rhyming one. Da, 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 down by the bay. Down by the bay is a fun one. Uh, so anyway, any kind of singing book like that. And then also, I love the gorgeous, sumptuous picture books about composers. And sometimes it's about a composer and his whole life like I shared one about Vivaldi on that video that I mentioned, um, but some of them are just about a particular um, piece of music that a composer wrote and a gorgeous picture book. Um, but some of them are also um, um, yeah, like describing a, a, a particular piece of music and it just has gorgeous illustrations to go with it. And there are quite a few and I use them in my music class, but they're great for homeschool and they're great for just general reading at home, music enrichment in your in your house. And then you can just turn on um, uh, the music and the background to listen to. There is a fun one. Um, I, I'll try and link a couple of these ones that I'm mentioning in the description box when I have a minute, but the, um, there's one about um, in the Hall of the Mountain King that my students love, that I love to read, that, that um, makes the story with a little boy and he goes to the Hall of the Mountain King and it visualizes everything as you're listening to the music and it's meant to be read with the music. You can actually watch videos of it online as well. Um, I might be able to link to one of those also. Anyway, those are some favorites. But then as the students get older and they're into chapter books, there are great, fun, engaging chapter book biographies of different composers and so those are fun to read. Um, I don't utilize them as much in a classroom setting because they're too long, but they're great for homeschool or for just kids of that age, um, you know, preteen, uh, older elementary, um, early middle school era to read. Um, and then as they get older, um, there are 
there are books. There are books for every genre. Um, there are books for um, every type of music and uh, picture books and chapter books and um, le lengthier books to read um, to spark imagination and interest. One other book I want to mention, I, <clears throat> I forget the name of it. I'll have to look it up and put it in the description box. I don't have an actual copy myself. I borrowed it from the, the kindergarten teacher who has a copy. I think it's called Because, um, but it's all about a girl who goes to um, see a concert, but then it traces back um, how, you know, the process that it took for her to be able to enjoy this music. Um, you know, not only the people who brought her to the concert, but um, you know, the music that was created and um, the instruments that were created and that and the training that the, the musicians did or whatever. Um, Anyway, it's a really good book. I'm probably like totally butchering the whole idea of it, but it's a fantastic picture book, pretty popular as well. Um, and if I can find the title of it, I'll link to that below as well. All right, and Tammy also asked me, least and most favorite classic and why? So my least favorite, I'm gonna tie it with two, and that is Why Sargasso Sea. I forget the name of the author of that one, but it is a retelling of Jane Eyre but it's supposed to be like Mr. Rochester's back and, and Bertha's backstory. And it was just awful and hideous and I hated it 100%. I didn't like anything about it. So that's the White Sargasso Sea. And Cold Comfort Farm is another one, which I think I just didn't have enough context reading it because it's, it's uh, supposedly spoofing like English country literature, whatever that is. Um, and I wasn't getting most of the jokes, I think. So I thought that it was just stupid. It was like inside jokes that I wasn't privy to. And I was like, okay, this is dumb. Um, and in the end, as I was thinking about the book, I was like, you know what? I actually don't think that that was a spoof of English country literature, or whatever it's called, English garden literature, whatever, I don't know. It's like, I think it was a spoof of Mary Poppins. And the main character, I forget her name. I feel like she was a Mary Poppins, but to adults in her family not to children, but to adults, um, to the point where you know how Mary Poppins goes away in the wind. Um, well, she, at the end of the book, she flies away in a plane. And yeah, it was totally Mary Poppins, but retold for adults and much stupider. So that's my opinion on that one. Uh, as far as most favorite classic, um, we're gonna go with anything by Austin, absolutely. Um, that's always an easy answer to that question. And you know, I, I don't have anything more creative to say when it comes to that. So I have a couple more questions. Um, the next one is from Taylor at Tales and Treats with Tay, and she wants to hear my salvation story. So I was raised in a Christian family, and my dad was actually a pastor of a small church in Maryland. And so I vaguely remember at a very young age, um, sitting with my mom on her bed and, um, and asking her questions about the gospel and about salvation, etc., and um, and accepting Jesus Christ as my Savior at that point. But again, I was raised in a Christian home, and my dad was a pastor, so I was at church all the time. Went to Sunday school all the time. Well, every Sunday, right? And I also went to a small Christian school up until third grade, and so. Basically, every at the end of every Bible lesson, the teacher would, um, and I, I don't necessarily think this is the right thing to do per se, but I, I, I understand why they did it, but they would, you know, invite students to pray, um, to accept Jesus as their savior if they had never done that before. And so anytime that happened in Sunday school or school or whatever, I was like, oh, well, you know, I guess I better do it again just to make sure it didn't, you know, just in case it didn't take that time. So clearly, I feel like I didn't really understand the gospel fully. I didn't, I hadn't made it mine, really. Um, it was something that I understood mentally, but had not taken to myself as a person. Until I was about 12 years old. And this is a very common story for people who grow up in Christian families and become believers. A lot of times, you know, at a young age, they would make a decision to believe, but then it's not really internalized and understood until around the age of 12, 13, or sometimes a little bit older. And for me, I was around 12 years old and we were actually visiting another church and there was a guest speaker there and he was preaching about the glory of God. And 
I just remember sitting there and I kind of had um, like an Isaiah moment where, you know, when Isaiah had the vision of God in the, in, in heaven and his response was, well, it was me. I am undone. <laughs> and that was my feeling. And if I could have crawled under the pews, I would have. Um, because I, it was the very first time I really, truly grasped the glory of God versus my own sinfulness and therefore my need to be saved from that sin. I don't think I had ever really grasped the goodness and the righteousness of the holiness of God until that point. And so that is the point when I look back and say, that is the time that I truly understood the gospel and accepted it for myself and um, I became a believer. Um, probably it was, you know, it was all like a process that started, you know, when I was five years old and it's a process that's ongoing, you know, like the, the sanctifying process continues to this day. But that moment when I was 12 is kind of what I look back as my, um, my moment of salvation when I actually accepted Jesus as my savior. And then um, Taylor also asked, what do you love about where you live? And I love Virginia. I love the rural countryside of Virginia, even though I don't actually live in it, but I live about a 15 minute drive from rural Virginia. And in fact, I'm in a Facebook group where people in my county um, will sometimes post pictures and say, hey, whose cows are these? They're in my backyard. Or somebody's goats wandered off. Or whose peacocks are these? <laughs> and it's so fun. I love that. I don't I don't live where wandering goats or cows come into my yard or chickens or anything, but I live close enough. It's within driving distance. So I really love that. I'm able to get like farm fresh eggs and um, my farmer's market is a walk away um, on a Saturday morning. And um, I just, I love that rural, being close to the rural. But at the same time, we're very close to everything. We have all of the major stores and grocery stores and restaurants and chains and everything that you would want. So we are within five minutes mostly of any of that kind of thing. Um, and it's just kind of a really bustling um, life here. I enjoy it. There's always something going on, something of interest. Um, and as I said, we live in a pretty affluent area. And so even though we are not rich, you know, we kind of bring down the, the averages there of uh, household income. <laughs> but um, I do enjoy, you know, having at my fingertips all of the different um, shops and experiences that I can choose to avail myself of if I happen to have, you know, room in my budget for it. The next question Taylor asked was, what have you learned since starting your channel? And I have learned so much. Um, I've learned about navigating booktube. I have a lot to learn still. Um, I haven't made it like, like I said, I don't have like major financial or readership or not readership, but subscriber, I guess, whatever goals necessarily, um, other than just creating a genuine community. Um, so there's a lot of technical stuff that I haven't really bothered to, to learn about too much. Um, but I have learned. Uh, along the way like it's impossible not to learn new things as you go along and um, I've definitely learned about that and I've learned a lot about because on booktube you are you get to interact with so many different people with different reading tastes and that is really a fantastic thing because I think it really helps you to see the value in certain different types of genres that otherwise you may not be interested in yourself. And it gives you a little more, I don't know, like open-mindedness about um, about different types of books that are not of your own personal preference, but you can gain an understanding of why other people might enjoy them. Um, so it's a whole other, it, it's the same thing when you read books, it, it, it generates more empathy and ability to understand different perspectives. It's the same thing when you talk about, talk with people about books um, because everybody has slightly different tastes and you get to understand them all and hear them all. And also I love that, you know, you can hear from different people who read the same book and all come away from it with different things. And I really love that. I really love learning from other people's perspective. Um, so those are things I've definitely learned since starting my channel. And I've also, I've also learned because I have to talk about it so much and um, prepare to talk about it. I've learned a lot more about myself and my own taste and what I'm interested in, what I'm not interested in. And uh, my own taste has changed and developed as I have been on my channel. So, um, 
And then finally, Taylor asked a favorite video that I have done so far. And um, that was really hard. Um, I have a few favorites. Um, and usually, and I think a lot of people would answer this question the same way. A lot of times, like what is your favorite as a content creator is not necessarily the favorite of the people who watch your channel, um, which is an interesting sort of irony that I think is true for many people. Um, but my personal favorite is is true in that sense. It's not one that made waves, not many people enjoyed it or commented on it or, or um, watched it, but that is a song, a book, and a fairy tale, a defense of romance. And it was just something that I was really thinking deeply about back um, last December. And um, it was just, um, there was a, a Christmas song and a book I was reading and um, an example of a fairy tale that all kind of worked together. And even though they were very disparate things, they all were speaking the same thing to me. And um, and it is all about uh, a defense of romance or reading romance. And so um, that one is one of my favorite videos. Um, so yeah. Um, and then Kelly at Kelly Reads A Lot asked me um, if I could play a character of a novel in a play or a movie, which one would I choose and why? Which is a great question. And I had to think a lot about it. Um, and I, I decided on Amy Dorrit from Little Dorrit by Charles Dickens because she's not like a, she's not a big flashy character. And I feel like I, I can't do big and flashy and, um, or even like very witty or whatever, you know, I feel like a background person which she's not really background. Like the whole story is about her, but she is a background in her family. They see her as background and she's just very steady and consistent. Now she is also very loving and kind. So, um, I'm not always like that. So yeah, that would definitely be an act sometimes, especially the way her family treated her. I would not be loving and kind to them in response to that. So that would definitely be acting for sure. But it's the kind of acting I think that I could do. Like it doesn't require a big personality or um, um, flashy looks or anything like that. She's just a normal everyday person living a normal everyday life. And yeah, I think that I could do Amy Dorrit in Little Dorrit. And also I think that that one is due for, a, for an adaptation. There is an older one floating out there somewhere that I have not been able to get that I would like to see, but um, that one would be a good one. So I believe those are the questions. If I missed one, I try to get all of them. Um, but if I missed any, I do apologize. Um, but I hope you enjoyed this peek into my life and my answers to the questions. And now we come to the giveaway. So all you have to do is just leave a comment in the comments below. Um, I, the gift or the, the giveaway is one of two things. You can choose which option you want. Um, the first would be um, a, an item from your wish list on Amazon or Thrift Books that I will um, purchase and ship to you. Or if you don't have a wish list on Thrift Books or Amazon, I would send you a gift card um, to either of those places, whichever one you prefer. And um, I need to have some way to get that to you. So if you don't have an Amazon or Thrift Books wish list that I can purchase from, I would need your email address or something to send you the um, the gift card. So um, as long as you're willing to get the gift card option, um, this is open to anybody um, in the US or Canada. I think that's mostly where people are from, but if you happen to be elsewhere in the world, um, you can have it also. Uh, so all you need to do to enter the giveaway is to leave a comment on this um, video and your comment can be about anything. It can be in response to one of the questions I asked or your own answer to any of the questions, um, your thoughts about any of the books or things that I mentioned, any comment will do. And I will choose a winner a week from today, so next Sunday, and I will send along your gift. Please do, um, I will respond to you in the comment first for the giveaway. Um, so if you can reply when I reply to your comment, that would be super helpful. 
Otherwise, if you have like Instagram or something like that where I can reach out and message you because YouTube, you can't really do that. Um, that would be fantastic as well. So um, if you don't have a YouTube channel and it would be easy easier for me to find you somewhere else where I can message you, maybe leave your username for Instagram, Goodreads, whatever, so that I can find you and connect with you to get you your prize. So I will choose one winner from all of the comments a week from today, next Sunday, and um, which is June 2nd, I believe. Um, and I will announce, I will announce the winner in my next Sunday video. So actually I will choose it Saturday night. So, um, June 1st. So goes through June 1st. You can comment between now and then, and I will choose the winner then and get you your gift. And here we are end of the video. And I'm just going to post this as it is. Hopefully there are not too many <sighs> moments. It was so fun chatting with you. Thank you for the questions. Thank you for watching up until this point and I will see you next time. Bye.